There's only been one blade. There's only ever going to be one blade. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and we have some sad news. It looks like Marvel's Blade movie has been delayed indefinitely. Poor K. I know, buddy, it's a huge bummer, but Marvel just took their movie off the schedule. So I'm going to explain the whole history of what happened here and how I think that this might bode very poorly for the future of the MCU. It looks like they can't get out of their comfort zone and try new things. It is also yet another post credit scene that will probably never pay off. Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? Now, in times like this, we shouldn't be alone, so a little later I'm going to be joined by Brianna McLarty and Tommy Bechtold so we can mourn this film together. What should have truly been a new chapter for the MCU that would have shown that this franchise could do anything. Now, I should also note though, there is a silver lining here. There was a big leak about a team-up movie that could feature Blade, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later after I talk to Brianna and Tommy. But before I tell you how we got here, guys, I want to remind you that we have new Venom parody merch for sale at our merch store. We have My Little Symbiont, Bully Maguire, Dirty Dancing Parody, and my favorite, Denim, which I find hilarious. Links for all of these are below. Please buy things so I can have toys and oatmeal. First, let's look at the timeline of events that got us here. Now, today, we think of Marvel as this huge brand name that other studios want to be attached to. But in the 90s, Marvel was box office poison. Like up to that point, we'd had Howard the Duck, a low-budget Spider-Man TV series, and straight-to-video Captain America and Punisher movies. The only good live-action Marvel was TV's Incredible Hulk, which was from the 70s. So the original Blade movie barely had any indication it was based on a Marvel comic book. It was was marketed as an edgy vampire flick, and the Marvel intro wasn't even added to the franchise until Blade Trinity in 2004. So while we credit 2000's X-Men and 2002 Spider-Man for kicking off the golden age of Marvel movies that concluded with Endgame, this age of cinema really started with Blade. The movie's leather and action aesthetic preceded The Matrix by a year, and Snipes even gave us the first superhero landing. Blade 2 was also a masterpiece by Guillermo del Toro, and Blade Trinity was also a movie. With Triple H. That's right. So let's talk about the many delays of this Blade movie before I bring on Brianna and Tommy to mourn what never was and talk about what can still be. So, on the heels of Avengers Endgame, Marvel Studios went to Comic-Con in 2019 and announced that Mahershala Ali was going to be the studio's new Blade. Two years later, in February 2021, they hired their first writer, Stacey Osei-Kafour, and then, later that year in July, they hired Bassam Tariq as a director, but he left a year later citing delays and creative differences. Then, Jan Demange came on in November of 2022 with Michael Starbury as a writer, and then True Detective creator Nick Pozzolato came on as the new writer in April 2023. Now, this could have been at the request of Mahershala Ali, who worked with Pizzolatto on True Detective Season 3. But then, Ali disagreed with Marvel on the project, leading to a new rewrite by Michael Green, and this is when the release was pushed back to November 2025. And then, in June this year, Eric Pearson replaced Green, with Demange exiting the director's chair. But then, at Comic-Con this year, Feige confirmed that Blade would be rated R, and they were not going to rush the project until yesterday when it was removed from Marvel's schedule. Now, I should note that Blade did already appear in an MCU movie. Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? That seemed to set up Kit Harrington's character, Dane Whitman, to become the superhero of the Black Knight, like in the comics. The Black Knight has a cursed sword, which would have made him a perfect fit to work within Ollie's Blade film. But then, Kit Harrington himself acknowledged... I think there was some misunderstanding about whether he was going to be in the Blade movie. He was never meant to be in the Blade movie and, and isn't. So, then why what? But why, why would they do any of that? Why? Where did they put him in there? Why? Well, I'm going to talk about this with Brianna and Tommy in a bit, like how Marvel just threw everything against the wall in their post-credits teases without actually delivering on any of them. And it's not like I think Blade is a great story just because it's like slashy, slashy vampire stuff. Every vampire story is rooted in really dark human desires, the desire and the impulse to consume. They're about addiction. And I can relate to that because I have a lot of bad habits myself that I would really like to get rid of. I know I do. I am still not welcome in St. Louis. Well, for instance, whenever I get like super stressed out, I want to squeeze my face really hard or clench my jaw on one side. So I needed something to help me forget those bad oral fixation habits and replace them with a positive habit. And that is why I started using Fume. They're the sponsor of this video. Hold on now, person. Is that a vape? No, Doug, this is not a vape. It's not electronic and it does not have pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals. Instead, it has these little plant-based cores that are infused with natural flavors to create natural flavored air. You see, guys, the flavored air category is quickly becoming the leading alternative to vaping and smoking. Fume contains no nicotine, it is not addictive, and it contains non-toxic flavors. Instead, it contains plant-based flavors like spearmint ice, cinnamon hearts, and my current favorite, 
crisp mint. Oh, that's why your breath has been smelling so nice lately. Yes, it is. See guys, with flavored air, you can satisfy your oral fixation through a passive diffusion system that does not use electronics, vapor, or combustion. But mostly, I like that it gives me something to reach for when I'm feeling anxious. It even has movable parts for fidgeting that make an incredibly satisfying sound. And you can get the fume topper, which is a rubber wrapper for the end, you know, which is good for chewing. Fume has served more than 300,000 customers like myself, and you can be their next success story. For a limited time, use my code SCREENCRUSH to get your free topper. Now, this is the perfect accessory for your fume device. Slip it onto the mouthpiece for a softer, warmer feel. It's chewable for those who love to fidget, and it's reusable. So head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use code SCREENCRUSH or scan the QR code on screen to get your free fume topper when you order your journey pack today. Now, back to Mephisto. So, let's look at these early Marvel post-credits teases. Iron Man brought on Nick Fury, but in the original cut, Marvel didn't even know exactly what they would be teasing. As if gamma accidents, radioactive bug bites, and assorted mutants weren't enough. And the Incredible Hulk post credit scene made it seem like Tony Stark was the one recruiting the Avengers. What if I told you we were putting a team together? So, even back then, Marvel didn't really know what they were doing. They were throwing things against the wall to see what stuck. But then, in Iron Man 2, Marvel hit their stride teasing the next upcoming movie with footage that they filmed on the set of that movie. Iron Man 2 featured a scene from Thor, and Thor teased the Avengers, and the post credit scene for Thor The Dark World introduced the Collector, and that scene was even directed by James Gunn because, you know, it was paid off in Guardians of the Galaxy. So smaller films were teased essentially movie to movie, or at least set up the next film in their respective franchise, while the big teases like Thanos were setting up entire phases. But today, Marvel's been so busy setting up new characters and spinoffs that they never deliver on the post-credits teases that they've put in a litany of Marvel movies. But I'm afraid that this apparent cancellation of Blade means that Marvel cannot escape their comfort zone. Everything in the MCU is done with a house style created by the same Viz dev team, and this has robbed their films of the uniqueness of an artistic voice. The rumors swirled that Marvel wanted Blade to be a low-budget R-rated film, like a budget of $40 million, and that would have been so cool. But when you hear about creative differences between the studio and the creatives, man, that sounds like the studio is forcing them to fit into to their brand. My way or the highway. Think Edgar Wright leaving Ant-Man or Patty Jenkins leaving Thor The Dark World. Maybe it's a miracle that we ever got a tour projects like Black Panther and Guardians of the Galaxy. Like, I'm not here to hate on the MCU, but I can see what this franchise can be, and I find this frustrating as a fan. Now, before I bring on Brianna and Tommy, I do want to remind you guys that we are going live on tour. Pretty soon we'll be in a city near you to talk about all the stuff that we can't see on YouTube. We're going to go behind the scenes with how we make our videos, do trivia, meet the team, and nerd out together. Links for everything are below. Now, a little later, I am going to talk about the new Midnight Suns new that could be giving us some hope, but first, I want to be among friends. So, that's just my thoughts, and like I said, I am deeply depressed about this, and I need to talk to two of my friends, Brianna McLarty and Tommy Bechtold. So, Brianna, Tommy, I know that we're really hurting here. This is something we, we all very much looked forward to. Brianna, you especially, because you're a massive horror fan, and this was going to be like the ultimate blending of, of two things for you. What's your state of mind right now hearing this news? I'm really sad. Like, I really, really was looking forward to Blade. If people ask me, like, what project I'm most excited for, I was like, Blade, I can't wait for Blade. Um, I even, like, in some of the Agatha talkbacks, brought up, maybe they're setting up Blade, because I was trying to, like, will it into existence. Uh, I'm really sad. I think it's not a great move for Marvel, because I think going back to kind of the basics as they were, I actually don't think that is going to work for them. I think they need to expand into other stuff and get weird with it, as we say here at this channel. So I, I'm depressed. I think it could have been such a good project. I think they cast the perfect blade and now we have nothing and I'm, I'm not happy about it. I'm not. Well, one thing we can say is it firmly does establish Luke Cage in the MCU <laughs> since now, uh, you know, his character and, and Luke Cage won't be, we don't have any weird, confusing multiverse stuff there. Brianna, before we go on, what is your socials real quick? I know they're linked below, but you can, where do people find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Brianna T. McClarty. There she is. And they, like I said, links are below. Tommy, how about you? Before we get into like uh, talking about the post-credits teases and all these production problems they ran into, what, how are you feeling right now? Uh, well, I don't want to be too dramatic or judgmental, but what a bunch of absolute feckless cowards. Uh, I guess enjoy uh, 10 more years of cookie cutter same as we ever saw member berries movies because god forbid i know that, that there are three existing blade movies which kind of contradicts my point but god forbid we we do something original or where we bring in an element of you know actual horror into the marvel universe 
I guess we're just going to have to live with a, a, a wonderful uh, Marvel special presentation, Werewolf by Night. But I just don't understand. I, I don't know. I guess it, it just doesn't feel from a armchair quarterback perspective that hard to get this movie going. It's Unless you're just... In a, working out of a culture of fear of making anything new or different or getting weird with it, as as Brianna said so so perfectly. And I, I just you have Mahershala Ali. What is the matter with you? Make the Blade movie. I I don't know. I know I sound like you know like a raging raging incel fanboy. Make the Blade movie, but come on, <laughs> come on, guys, make the Blade movie. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Well, honestly, in it. the time you've been talking, I went ahead and wrote a Blade movie. It's not that hard, good. right? So, <laughs> Tommy, before we get too far into to you assaulting our earballs with more of this this tirade, can you please tell me how what your socials are and where people can find you? Yes, you can find me at Tommy Bechtold on all platforms. Early adopter to those social medias. Got in, took my name. Uh, at Tommy Bechtold for all the fun and free content you can handle. Yeah, look, I'm bummed about it too for a lot of the reasons I talked about earlier and that we're going to talk about in a bit. But mostly it's like, it was strange to me they cast him so early, two years before they had a director. You know, like they had laid the groundwork in the Eternals for his movie. And Tommy, I know we're going to get to this in a bit, but like, they really started to put the cart before the horse, I think because they were overconfident. And it's, it's insane to me to think that Secret Invasion found a way to get made before Blade. You know, Secret Invasion, the show's so nice, they saw, they shot it twice. It cost over $200 million, which, by the way, the new version of uh, the Reign of Marvel Studios has a whole chapter on that. It's fascinating stuff. I highly recommend you guys pick up that book. Mm. Uh, Brianna? What what happened here with these production problems? Why did it take them so long? To, what seems like a really simple movie? Why did it take so long to get that off the ground? Um, I think there were several problems. I think for one, it was always going to be difficult for a Marvel blockbuster like movie to be as gory as Blade necessitates. Obviously, with Deadpool and Wolverine, they started to get more into the R-rated territory, but like that still doesn't hold a candle to blade especially if you're looking at like those first three movies uh obviously this would have been a redo but like one of the most iconic scenes in the first movie is the blood club like how is marvel going to do that on a big screen now when they first announced this movie i have like marvel tv wasn't nearly what it is now they didn't they hadn't really released they had not released any tv shows like that um that had gone to disney plus and so i think they really pigeonholed themselves by saying this has to be a blade big movie instead of mm. uh, instead of doing something that was either like a special presentation though i would have wanted it to be longer but they could have made a great mini series that would have been done really well i actually think this is one of the few projects that would have worked very well in like a shorter format like six episodes maybe and mm -hmm. they could have made it like werewolf by night and werewolf by night is honestly it's pretty gory for the mcu <laughs> like and they do a great job with it and they use a lot of the older tricks that they use in horror movies to kind of get them you know, above board. And on top of that, they could have taken some really interesting things from directors like Tarantino, where he made all of his vampires have green blood, just so that it would keep the rating not an NC-17. Mm -hmm. There were so many options for them to do something that was in their guidelines, in their parameters, but would have actually been very successful. And I don't see how they were going to do that on a big screen if they wanted it to connect to the mainline MCU. Because even with Deadpool and Wolverine, like we've had Once Upon a Time it, with the Deadpool, which is like the kids version of that movie. Mm -hmm. So people can, like with younger kids, can have their kids watch that and they can still sort of keep up with the MCU. I don't think that was going to happen with Blade. They could have also just kind of made a separate side thing for Midnight Suns um that was just their own thing and had blade start that i would have loved that i think that would have been cool i love that the mcu is so interconnected but i think agatha all along shows us that like you don't have to have like a show that is the most mm -hmm. interconnected thing ever to be a good show and the mcu is supposed to be an entire world there's gonna be stories that are just over to the side and that is okay as long as they're good stories and instead i think they were really trying to fit blade like very gory bloody adult movie and character into like their cookie cutter and it just didn't work and instead of just being okay with having something that was weird or different they just kind of stopped the project which i think is i think it's sad i don't think it's good for marvel i don't think that's like i don't think going back to the basics is going to get the brand further I think some of the most cool things have been like WandaVision, which it was just that WandaVision was weird when it came out. Everyone forgets that. Sure. Everyone weird. was like, That's true. what's yeah, happening? Yeah. I so, think yeah, the first three episodes, I, especially. Go ahead, Tommy. 
I, well, I think Brianna made a great point, and it's like you you think about Daredevil and and, and Wolverine. They have the luxury of Daredevil referencing or Daredevil. I'm sorry, Deadpool. Good lord, good lord, don't come for me, fans. Actually, I, I believe you're referring to Deadpool, not Daredevil. They're listen, I, I stayed up. I stayed up. I stayed up past midnight watching football last night. Give me a break, ah, uh, nerds. Anyway, Deadpool, <laughs> Deadpool, and Wolverine. I like they have the the gift of that being an R-rated movie that the main character can be referential about the MCU. So I agree with Brianna. It's like the, the the blade making the blade true to the to the way that blade fans want it to be made would be a more difficult kind of bridge to gap between the MCU. But I think therein lies like kind of one of the fundamental issues the, that Marvel Studios has right now, which is like they are it's a very homogenous stew that cannot be disrupted with these like you know spicier ingredients. It's just uh, it, by its nature, it kind of all has to like fall in line and assimilate to this this one kind of flavor profile that is like our heroes are strong. The bad guys eventually are vanquished and like, you know, uh, earth's mightiest, uh, heroes will, will conquer all eventually, uh, all, all evil doers, evil doers that wish us harm. And, and so I, I understand the uphill battle. I just, is it the point of like making new art to like push boundaries and push the envelope and, you know, not that Blade is new art, but a new Blade movie would be a new piece of art. And I, I guess I just, right. it's frustrating to me that they won't, that that it's it does feel to me like we can look forward to you know kind of rebooting of the x-men getting a new captain america and all that stuff and that's all great but we cannot look forward to some of the more alternative or 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 slightly left of center uh projects that that i think some you know comic book fans were hoping to 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 get to experience with with this juggernaut that is the marvel studios i completely so agree with that oh yeah you too. go ahead rihanna no. I completely agree with that. And I also think they actually run a really big problem of sort of fans aging out of the MCU, um, mm-hmm. especially some of their younger fans. When Avengers came out, I was 12. I was obsessed with that movie. I saw it like six times in theaters. Mm-hmm. Ever since then, I have watched every single MCU movie that came out in theaters pretty much opening night. Mm-hmm. As But that came out when I was little. And like, of course, when I was younger, those stories that were more cut and dry were a little more interesting to me. But now I'm 25. I have a lot of friends who are also like around my age, started watching the MCU around my age. And we're adults now. We do want some more adult content because we didn't necessarily come from reading a ton of comics. We came from the MCU was like a major part of our growing up, essentially. And I think by announcing, especially announcing projects that seem like, okay, cool, we're getting into sort of the more adult MCU as some of this fandom ages up, and then just shutting them down, it's very disheartening because I I mean, the Young Avenger seems really cool, but, and I really am excited for it, but it probably won't, wouldn't have spoken to me or won't speak to me as much as like Blade would have, just because I'm, I'm not a teenager anymore and I'm 25 and I just think that would have been so much cooler. Mm Mm-hmm. Just to just to check you guys on a couple of things, I do I do have to know. We don't know why it was pulled. We're making I think what are reasonable assumptions that yeah. you know all we know so yeah. far is creative differences. Mahershala Ali disagreed about the script. Kevin Feige did say it's going to be rated R, and, and like last year, this year I think in July, he said it's going to be rated R, and it's important to not rush it. So there is all of that. Like, but I think we can make a reasonable assumption here. It is also possible that every pitch and script was terrible like that's also a thing mm-hmm. but it definitely to me seems like minimum Herschel ali had an idea for the character or something in mind for the character that maybe he and marvel studios didn't align with like there's just a lot of nobody agreeing on what they want it to be i think i had heard at one point that they were eyeballing like especially after Iger came back and the marvels was released they were eyeballing doing a smaller budget am i wrong about that brianna no that's what i had heard as well that's what i heard too and i think that i honestly think that would have been better for the movie i think like a grindhouse blade uh like low budget oh, style again kind of like werewolf by night that's sick that looked visually very yeah. interesting and i think blade could have done that and they would have had a lot of leeway then to play with special effects and make them sort of it's still R-rated, like we can still see the blood, but even just doing like the 70s thing where the blood, like the saturation of the blood is like somehow almost like pink or orange. It's so mm-hmm. bright red. Yeah, like um, you said, dust till dawn, turn it green. They do that in the comics all the time with purple blood. Like there's a really particularly gory thing with Thanos and Lady Death where they use purple blood. Sorry to step on you, but you're 100% right there. There's also a thing looking at it where... You know, the original Blade, we have these fine, oh, it's so gritty, there's a bloodbath. There was also the giant blood monster at the end of the first one. Like, there were kind of this trope of, like, the big fight at the end that I was looking forward to this movie 
maybe not having to do, but with Marvel's production pro their post-production process where they do viz dev, where they develop the visuals before the screenplay, I got to think that's a big part of the problem here, that they had already poured far too much money into something they that was planned and then mm. they had to scrap it. And that's why Secret Invasion cost so much money because they had gone down one path. It didn't work depending on the rumors you believe for what reason. And then they had to like, go back another way. And I agree with you guys 100%. Werewolf by Night, Brianna, you approach it from this perspective of keep it low budget, keep it grindhouse. I think that would have been amazing. But you also brought up a really great point about Agatha. And one thing about Agatha all along that I did not expect, you really don't need to have seen a whole lot of Marvel before this. You know, if you have seen WandaVision, obviously that's important in Multiverse of Madness. But if you haven't, it's a cool show about witches. And witchcraft has been like hinted at in the MCU. Like Frigga says, mm -hmm. I was raised by witches boy and things like that. But then they actually dive into tarot and all these other really cool things in the history of witchcraft. So for a witch nerd like yourself, Brianna, who's into crystals and stuff, it's been awesome to write for. <laughs> I thought you were talking to me. I <laughs> And we keep getting, well, you know, Tommy, we want to talk about your, your Wiccan sensibilities a little bit later. So I, do, I was I looking forward crystal. to diving into that vampire. <laughs> yeah. I was Literally looking forward just... to diving into horror, monsters, all that stuff that we've had hinted at. It does make me wonder if they were ever planning the Midnight Suns. And if they were, you know, maybe the reason they were holding off on Ghost Rider is because it's the multiverse saga and they think they need Nicolas Cage Ghost Rider. And Tommy, to get to my point, it really does seem like a lot of putting the cart before the horse. And that brings me to post credit scenes. Now, as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, Mahershal Ali has already been in an MCU film. We heard his voice at the end of The Eternals teasing that he would team up with Kit Harrington, who then said almost immediately, no, I haven't heard anything about the next movie yet. Big warning sign. What do you think about these Marvel post credit scenes? Yeah, I mean, I I liken it, you know, as human beings, we relate things to ourselves. And one thing that, you know, made me a very unhappy person in my early 20s was that I could not experience joy in what was right in front of me. It was always looking forward to what was beyond, looking forward to what was next, looking forward to the future. Then the future would become the present and I would be miserable. Uh, trips, parties, dates, whatever. And it took a lot of work. And I feel like I am going through that again with, with Marvel movies. And I've had to kind of work on that with myself where it's like, you know, as we brought up earlier, the, the first you know, Marvel movies kind of led with post credit scenes that were directly kind of indicators of what was to come in the immediate future, whether it was the next movie or very close to the, the next, within the next couple of movies. Now it feels almost as though they're like, why don't we throw this in a post credit scene and then kind of, you know, if it works out, it works out. And if not, we'll, 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 we'll wreck on it. Or that's the best faith argument. The, the other thing is just the hubris of like, of course, it's going to work out with Marvel Studios. I would mm -hmm. I would point to the other post credit scene in the Eternals with Pip and uh, and uh, Pip and Eros. Right. Is that who uh, yeah. they're saying? And, and then I would put and then my put my post credit scene. I most want to see resolved, by the way. But that's just yes, my weird Marvel sure. cosmic stuff. So please. Yeah. Of course. And then I would say to me, you know, there, there's there's a couple of moments in comic book movies in the last four, three, four years that have kind of been so grim to me that I've been like, oh, these both these universes need a hard reset. DC is getting it now and Marvel's getting it. And they were basically similar. And, you know, it was Brett Goldstein uh, commenting on his appearance as Hercules, where he basically didn't really know what he was filming when he was filming it, didn't know what it how it tied into the movie had no information about the future and yet mm -hmm. it's presented in this way of like this guy is hunting down thor for the next thor movie right like it's like he he's like acknowledging a command from his father excuse me from his father zeus and it's like all of a sudden it, it, uh you, you, we have the actual talent who plays the role or does the cameo on the post credit scene being like yeah i actually have no idea if i'm ever coming back or if that was just you know a fun little moment and it, and, and i realize you know we're intimately closer to it with what we do for a living but it's like there are people who are like deciphering and scouring through these movies for clues of what's to come and you can really forget to enjoy the actual mm. movie if you are just doing and by we i mean me i'm holding a mirror up to myself I think Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness was my like rock bottom for this. And I realized there are that's a champagne third world problem. But I went through the Wait, entire... really? You think as far as the movies being bad or as far as the post credits? No, case? I mean, for me personally, as a viewer of movies, I found myself the first time I watched Multiverse of Madness unable to enjoy it because I was looking for 
it to be Got a it. gateway to other movies and what gotcha, was next, gotcha. what yeah. would be revealed. Nothing to do with the movie. I, I watched the movie again because I said, what is wrong with me? I need to reprogram. Oh, that's and interesting. Yeah. Take a breath. And I, and I also did have one of the, this is not a plug, uh, AMC delicious signature Dr. Strange cocktails before it. And uh, that, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe led me to be a little more introspective, but I, I will say like, that to me was a moment where I was like, I have ceased to enjoy these movies just for what they are as movies. And I'm now only consuming them as a, how can I branch out and make a, you know, make a theory or a video. And that's all fine and good and great. But if we can't at our base be enjoying the movies and like, you know, consuming them. And if we're just looking for post-credit scenes and mid-credit scenes and what are they going to reveal, it's going to push these studios to make those more tantalizing and more provocative and more bullshit, quite frankly, you know, like, like just th- just show you something that might be cool. Show you something that the fans want to see without any kind of plan to deliver on it. And I, I'm sorry for getting all lathered up here, but I just, I feel it's just a, it's such a no, life it's, lesson. It's, I can no, it's clearly, agree. I clearly a personal to you, both on a life level and on a, yeah. on a regular yeah. level. So it sorry, is, yeah. what are your well, thoughts? No, I- I completely agree with Tommy. I made like I literally made a TikTok about this, just being talking about how fans. It was like a very it was an audio TikTok, but it was like very talking about how fans are always looking for the next thing and like just want to be negative about yeah, stuff that absolutely. they seem to enjoy. I yeah. will say one thing that does worry me genuinely with all of the hanging post credit scenes is some actors in Hollywood are not are kind of not super happy that becoming like a superhero character has become kind of the pinnacle of being famous and an Mm -hmm. actor in Hollywood. And I do think with some of these hanging post credits that never get addressed, Charlie's throne, like is the one that for me comes to mind. Cause I was really excited about that. I worry about them losing talent. I hope so. Cause I really want that character, but um, I do worry about them losing talent at some point or actors not wanting to work with them as much because it used to be, if you got into an MCU movie, you could pretty much guarantee that you were set for a while. Like it was grueling, Mm -hmm. but you were going to make a lot of money and you were going to have like at least three movies. Probably if you were a main character, Mm. Um, you could also count that it was probably going to be a pretty well received movie like Thor, the dark world, which in my opinion is, one of the worst MCU movies, still certified certified fresh. I yeah. don't know how that movie is certified fresh and Quantumania is not. I'm not saying I love Quantumania. I'm just saying yeah. Thor Dark World is bad. No, that's um, a good that's a good side by side. I love that. Yeah. Well, you know, you, Brianna, you're also seeing this. You had a lot of act you like Anthony Hopkins in interviews is like, yeah, I show up, they put armor on me, I shout a little bit. Like a lot of actors have been more public and dismissive about the superhero genre. And I, frankly, Hollywood in general, critics, studios, everybody was ready for this to end, which is why as soon as they sniffed blood in the water with the Eternals, everybody dogpiled that movie. And frankly, mm-hmm. that I don't think that movie deserved it, but that's for a different talk back, okay. right? Mm-hmm. I do wonder, I do worry though, because with Blade, there were like genuinely cool teases that they could have done. What the, what we're seeing here, for instance, the reason why we didn't get into a Blade movie right after the Eternals, like we would have in phase two or three, is because they had too many other things going on. And we've talked about that at length on this, on the show. I think that there is a future for horror adjacent Marvel content because it is to me the best chance they have at getting a new audience outside of comic book fans. And I can excite just specific examples. I have more people in my life that are not Marvel or DC people that are watching Agatha uh, and enjoying Agatha because it has, you know, witchcraft and it has, you know, ghosts and, and whatever. I, I believe that, that there's, there's, there is a smart and, and valid place for this type of content in, in, in our MCU. And I'm hopeful that, that it can include Blade, but I think it can still be done without Blade. I think it's probably just going to be done through, through the witches and Sorcerer Supremes. I think that's going to get us our, uh, our sorcerers and our witches are going to are going to lead us to our horror salvation in the MCU for better or for worse. Brianna, what can what can they learn from Agatha? I think they can learn that to get new audiences, you cannot stay in the box. And in some ways, I feel like they did a Pandora's mm-hmm. box a little bit with WandaVision, where that really defined what an MCU movie or project could be for me. And so then I started expecting a lot more. A lot of people just care about good stories. They don't necessarily care as much about superheroes. And if you can make a good story, which Agatha is, people will watch. Like I've had friends watch it and call me and be like, 
what's this one thing about? And I'm like, oh, I got you. And the other thing is the MCU is so popular. Like everyone knows someone in the, who's into the MCU. So you can always find somebody if you don't have a part that explain like you don't understand. But I think if you make good stories, weird stories, things people cannot find other places, the audience is going to show up for you. I mean, I also know for me, I've had like more female friends be like into the MCU than ever because they just, A, it's an all, like they think the whole thing is super cool with the whole coven and it's an all female cast. And then also like, I just have a lot of people I know who really ship Rio and Agatha. And so they mm-hmm. were like, I'm going to start watching the show mm-hmm. because yeah. I want, I keep seeing edits of them and I want to, yeah. I want to see what it's about. Yeah. So My mom think- heard, my mom literally heard Catherine Hahn's voice and was like, what is this? And I was like, it's a Marvel show about witches. She's like, do I have to watch other stuff? I'm like, not really. And she sat down and watched two episodes with me. So I if, you get, if you get I my love mom. That. See, that's what it you, should be like. I agree. You yeah. should be able yeah. to pull in people who are fans of Doctor Who for, with Loki mm-hmm. and fans of action like mm-hmm. Tom Ryan or Tom Clancy things with mm-hmm. Falcon and the Winter Soldier. That's what it should be like. Yeah, and I think they do they do creepy stuff and they do interesting stuff. People are gonna show up, especially mm-hmm. Disney does have a bigger budget. I think even Agatha mm-hmm. all along being a pretty practical set when they've talked about it, that show looks good. That show looks really It nice. really does. The road is incredible. I mean, the practical elements of the road and, and even some of the stuff that's probably just made to look practical is, is so good. Exactly. And somehow the road looks more realistic than the forest they actually filmed in for the Acolyte. I'm not sure how they, <laughs> yeah. they manage that. Don't talk to so me guys, about how I'm that gonna, show looks. <laughs> don't, don't, yeah, I can get into that right now. We've got a lot to say about the Acolyte in future videos too, but we have to leave that there. Thank you guys both for joining me. So earlier I mentioned that there was a ray of light in all this darkness. Reliable leaker Daniel RPK recently said that he heard Marvel is looking to fast track a Midnight Suns movie and are looking for directors. Here's the Midnight Suns. I'm glad you asked. Midnight Suns was Marvel's team of dark, gritty heroes at various times with members like Morbius, Ghost Rider, and Blade. So we've suspected for a while that with characters like Werewolf by Night, Man-Thing, Blade, Agatha, and Elsa Bloodstone, that maybe the Marvel Cinematic Universe was forming this team. I think a bunch of guys like us should team up. We always thought that a Blade movie would be a jumping off point for the franchise, but now maybe that's not the case. Maybe Blade, Black Knight, and a relaunched Ghost Rider will be the MCU's Midnight Suns. And that's very exciting, but I still mourn the loss of my low budget gritty Blade flick. And I worry that this means that Marvel will not stray from their comfort zone. But like I talked about with Brianna and Tommy, at least they're seeing the success of Agatha and then recognizing that the MCU works best when it is different and weird. Well guys, that's just my thoughts on the Blade cancellation, but tell me what you think down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.